So welcome, my name is Christopher Packard, uh, and I've recently written a book called Mythical Creatures of Maine. It's a field guide, it's an encyclopedia of the creatures found in the folklore of, the, uh, of all the cultures who have lived here in Maine, all the way from the prehistory of the Wabanaki all the way to modern cryptozoology with lumberjack lore and French Canadian lore and early settler lore all sort of thrown in there as well. And we'll try to go through pretty quickly here uh, through all of the, you know, a nice little survey of those. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about me and how I came to write this book. So I'm a big outdoorsman. And I think if you're going to study creatures that live in the main landscape, you really need to be familiar with what's out there. So, you know, get out there as much as you can. I'm an avid, you know, I'm an avid paddler. This last summer, I paddled the Allagash River with my uh, youngest son. And we saw the ghost trains and camped at the old lumber depots and just that deep history and like seeing the landscape where these creatures live is so important. I'm a hunter. I love to hunt birds. And I'm also a trail runner. Here I am in uh, Camden Hills uh, State Park. And uh, I'm on, maybe I'm on Ragged Mountain there, I think. Uh, but I love to run on those and do these long things. I probably covered about 600 or so miles in the last 12 months just on trails alone. Um, and I just love being out there and getting out there and just really knowing nature, just like the people who were talking about these, who knew these creatures originally and who know them best and know the land best. Um, and, and I think that really colors the way that I view these things. There's some other things that color the way that I view these creatures and this folklore as well is I'm a biologist by training. I attended Eastern Kentucky University to study field botany and I worked in environmental impact statements and I'm currently also, here I am with a stuffed pancreas that a student made. I'm also a high school science teacher and I spend all day for the last two decades teaching young people to think critically about evidence-based reasoning and replication and what it means to really prove that something exists. I'm also a homesteader. I raise my own chickens. I raise my own food. I do a lot of preserving and canning. And these are the same types of things that our ancestors did uh, that lived in this area and knew these creatures and understood the way that they were. And so it's that that I think really gives me the lens that I'm going on. And some of it's contradictory, right? Some of this idea that there's creatures that are mysterious that science doesn't know about, you know, might seem at first like it's at odds with my scientific background. And to some extent it is. So why did I write this book if I spent all this time and have devoted a big chunk of my life to talking about science and then I write a book about things that, you know, can't be proven exactly by science? Well, first off, I grew up, I, I'm actually, sadly, my father, who's from Maine, uh, moved and went to college in Ohio and met my mom. And so I actually grew up in Cincinnati, but I spent summers uh, with my grandfather on the shores of Sebec Lake in central Piscataquis County. He was a guide and a woodsman, as was uh, my ancestors uh, for a couple generations before that. And they owned this place called Packard's Camps, which was previously called the Lake House. And this is my great great grandfather who bought this camp and ran it for lumberjacks and spool mill operators and uh, some French settlers in the area. And he knew everybody. There's a little building off to the side that says, welcome like gum pickers and, uh, and blueberry rakers and bear trappers. And, you know, people would come there uh, and, and he would hear all these stories. And my family is full of great storytellers. And I grew up on a pretty interesting diet of mythical, mythical creatures from my grandfather, the guide. Now, I was also always interested in this guy. This is one of the most famous pictures, Bigfoot, and sort of seeing Bigfoot uh, and, and reading about him and seeing that it was science, uh, you know, really intrigued me that there was stuff out there that we hadn't discovered. And so it kind of like knowing that there was a mystery, and I've since learned that there are lots of mysteries in biology that we're still learning about, you know, that there are things that are difficult to find. I've spent hundreds of hours being paid looking for a plant called small world begonia. Uh, with maps that are very accurate about where it might live for coal mining permits in the southern Appalachians and never seen it. So, you know, maybe this guy who can get up and walk around uh, are, you know, are out there. And so as a kid, I was intrigued and, and I loved being outside and I had these experiences with my grandfather. And actually, the idea of mythical creatures and cryptozoology is a big part of what got me into 
thinking about, you know, into science and becoming a scientist to deepen my understanding of what's actually out there, because that's the way that today, today, we study the world. And so that led me into biology, and I got really into biology, and I kind of forgot about these stories that my grandfather had told me. I assumed he had just made them up to sort of amuse me. This is actually my great-great-grandfather. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then I picked up an old book of folklore uh, at a thrift store, and I saw that these creature stories that my grandfather had told me about the side hill gouger and the tree squeak and the wedge ledge chomper and the pelt and thumper ding maw, these were all creatures that people had been talking about for over a century, for almost two centuries. And so I thought these are important. These are things that need to be shared and understood. So I started collecting all of these stories and, uh, and then I collected more stories and I saw that those lumberjack stories were connected to other stories, Wabanaki, sto Wabanaki stories, come right on in. Come right on in. And, uh, and so it just sort of became this big collection, my wife might say obsession. Uh, and she informed me that I needed to do something with this collection. And so it became this book, despite the fact that I'd sort of forgotten about my love of that. And I'd even forgotten about a lot of those stories that my grandfather had told me. And so people say to me, okay, so you're a biologist, you have all this training and you've, you've collected all these stories, but are these creatures, are they real? Do you think they're actually real and they're actually out there? And then as a biologist, you know, I have to say, we don't have the biological evidence needed to prove that they're actually real in a scientific way, right? But that lends the question of what is real? Scientific understandings and ways of thinking, this paradigm that we have today, which is, you know, just the way we think about the world says that's the only way that something can be real. And it's not very old, that way of thinking. Only about a hundred years have we been thinking about that, thinking that the world is fixed, that everything that we know can be found in these ways that we understand, even though science is constantly searching, even though science is constantly expanding the boundaries of what we understand is real and what we can detect. You know, if you know anything about quantum science, you know that stuff is really crazy. And even if you go back like, you know, to, you know, 40 years or so, the idea of like a cell phone transmitting like the sum of like all world knowledge at my finger trips in my pocket and being able to call anybody from anywhere is pretty crazy that you could get something that small. So we're constantly changing and learning. And that's the way that science is. But another good thing about science is even though science doesn't have the evidence for it, Science isn't into disproving that things exist. It actually can't do that at all. All it can say, and all it should say, a good scientist, is that we don't currently have evidence to support the existence of those things. So before this idea of scientific understanding came about, what we found was that actually everybody believed that these creatures, or the vast majority of people believed that these creatures were real, right? That they existed and that they influenced the world in an important way that maybe is different than what we understand from a scientific perspective today. Whether you're a European peasant on the, on the, you know, on the farm or whether you're a sailor or whether you're a woodsman or an early settler who came over to America or you're a Wabanaki person, you have a fundamentally different understanding that us today as modern people just don't understand. They believed in the transformative changing properties of the universe that things were not necessarily fixed. In particular, like the Wabanaki have a language that actually, you know, whose territory we're on here in the Penobscot territory uh, is, uh, is, you know, constantly in, you know, it's, it's a language with not that many nouns and that is constantly about changing and adapting and actually morphing into things. It's a language sometimes described as a language of verbs and you conjugate things. So you don't give things like names, like it's fixed like this, but it's actually something that's being this and they have animate tenses and they have present tenses. And these were people who understood that nature changed, whether they were French peasants on the farm or sailors or Wabanaki hunters whose lives depended on understanding the seasons and the seasonal change and they believed that there were these other realities where things could appear and they could disappear. They could change size, they could change shape. And the Wabanaki had different conjugations to indicate whether they were talking or still do, because the language is alive, pardon me, uh, you know, talking about 
things in ways that have a conjugation that means like distant past or imminent and present. And so these were things that were understood to be real in the same way and spoken about in the same way that bears, beavers, trees, or crops were, right? And so today we're like, oh, they're just myths, they're just stories, but these were things that fundamentally shaped the way that these people viewed the world. They were important to their survival. And so when people would ask them about what was around, they would say, oh, this is around and this is around. And there's these little people that can change shape and there's mermaids and there's you know, these, these hairy monsters and things like that that you can't find. And, and these, this is a, a, a sort of a global phenomenon where we see people who are living indigenously close to the land are always telling similar stories like this. So why do all these cultures have these stories about these things that still remain beyond science? These floating orbs and balls of light, which are called Bay Follet in French tradition, or Will-o'-the-Wisps or Esquididad, in, which I've probably butchered the pronunciation in Penobscot, uh, as described by Joe Polis, uh, Henry David Thoreau's guide when he was exploring Maine. Uh, and so, or at least Thoreau's understanding of that. Of course, there's a language barrier with everything that we know about the Wabanaki, uh, the, the early culture. Um, the best way to learn any of that stuff is, of course, go to these people who are still alive and still telling their stories. And they know all that best. But that said, why do all cultures have these creatures about little people, monsters, water monsters, serpents, balls of light that are floating around, fairies? I think there's something out there, right? I think that's evidence that all human cultures have these stories, right? And there's all sorts of things that we, you know, even today that we believe in that aren't like provable by science. I mean, take like cryptocurrency or even stocks. Those are things that you can't quantify. You can't measure, you can't prove a real by science, but they're fundamentally real in our understanding of the world. Some of us in this room, some of us on Zoom may even be retired living on these unreal assets that we actually have. And we believe they're real, so they're real. Now, I'm not saying these creatures are only real because we believe they're real. I'm just saying that there's things in the world that science can't directly measure that are real and affect reality. So even if you're like, that's all hogwash, people lived as if they were real, they lived their lives, they treated them uh, as if they were real. And so therefore, in that sense, they were real. They were real in a cultural sense at the absolute minimum right? And they're important. They're shared in every culture around the world. There are inheritance, right? So this is the deep history, cultural folklore, and it's all about oral tradition. It's things that change. It's not fixed. Their names will switch between things. Descriptions may vary, but cores of truth remain, and they're, they're passed down in myths, legends, tall tales, and fairy tales. And we're like, oh, well, they don't all agree. Well, it doesn't matter because in the way that people who believe in these creatures, who talked about these creatures and knew these creatures best, that was part of what they did, was they changed, they adapted, they had a relationship with humans. And so when I researched this, I had some great conversations with a whole bunch of different types of people, but I also poured through tons of old books, tons of old articles, anthropological, newspapers, history books, history texts. So this case is full of like a couple hundred articles. There's like 200 sources that are cited in the back of the book and probably a bunch that I forgot to put in there that also affected the way that I think about things. All that came together to try and create this guide so that we can restore our relationship with these creatures that our ancestors have talked about. That we can tell their stories and understand the cultural meanings and connections that they mean and also maybe a way of relating to the world around. So in New England, one of the oldest creatures that early settlers talk about is this guy. It's always described, and there's you know, hundreds of sightings of this. It's actually the, the richest area in the world, the North Atlantic here off the coast of, uh, you know, from Cape Ann in uh, Massachusetts, all the way up to Newfoundland, is the densest region of sea serpent sightings in the entire Atlantic Ocean, maybe even in the world. And so... They were always described as this undulating creature. This is an 1800s picture, and that's egg rock off Nahant, 
uh, by Lynn of Massachusetts, if you know where any of those are. And we would have similar descriptions from all sorts of people, from very reliable, like General Merriam, the person, you know, Brigadier General in the United States Army who invented the canvas backpack and was highly decorated at a Medal of Honor, to people that were probably not very trustworthy. Was some of it mistaken identity? Sure. But hundreds of independent sources from ministers and mayors and people with good education and sailors who lived their life on the sea talking about it. General Merriam wrote a letter to the Smithsonian or what would later become the Smithsonian describing this creature that he saw to preserve it. There were societies created to look for this creature. Sightings have dropped off drastically in the, the mid-1900s when motorized boats uh, started to sort of take place uh, of uh, the, the early sailing ships that were making a lot of these observations. So a lot of hypotheses have been thrown out there. We lack still the biological evidence to prove that anything exists, but perhaps like some of the fish that have disappeared, the cod that have been overfished here in the Gulf of Maine, uh, and the, the changes that have, that have occurred and the sounds that are here perhaps have changed the behavior of such a creature. So sea serpents, and here's Dan, our illustrator who's joining us today, which is awesome. Uh, here's his interpretation of that, which I think is a beautiful image. I love the pen and ink uh, that he's really captured this, that we, there were these huge creatures always with undulating backs, not swimming side to side like a snake, right? Uh, but up and down, almost like a mammal or like a, a, uh, a leech moving in an undulating up and down sort of way. And there's been all sorts of hypotheses uh, about this creature in there. And so this is one that interestingly, I've had conversations with some native people, some elders from the Penobscot nation who said, you know, we don't really have a, you know, it's interesting that this creature was mostly described by early settlers. This came with the Europeans. We didn't have a big saltwater serpent before they arrived. And so, you know, there's an interesting interplay in there because the people who were here first, the Wabanaki people, all the way from the Micmac and the purple on the top, all the way down to the Abenaki down in green. Uh, and then of course, uh, where we're at here, sort of on the boundary of that green and that pink uh, are the Penobscot nation and a lot of the, the Abenaki nations, which are actually several of them, all part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, ended up leaving the area and kind of, you know, because of wars and conflict and things like that, and suffered greatly from uh, colonization. And a lot of their stories are kind of lost, uh, some of them came up and lived with the Penobscot and some of them went up into Canada where, you know, European colonists were a little bit friendlier. And so there's all sorts of interesting creatures in there. There's a list of their names. Uh, you probably recognize some of those. Uh, one of the most familiar is Pomola or Bomole, uh, which is a creature that lives on the top of Mount Katahdin. Today, it's mostly known as a creature that looks kind of like this. Uh, and this is drawn by the illustrator. Uh, of uh, Bambi for Disney, actually. Uh, his last name is Day, his first name. And so this was talked about, this is from the, uh, an illustration about chimney pond tales. And so this is a guide who lived on chimney pond uh, on Mount Katahdin. And this big fearsome critter lived up there that he had, was, had a relationship with and he spun a bunch of yarns about it. And this creature has haunted up there uh, this, the, this peak such that the native Wabanaki would, would you know, according to legend, would not go above tree line, and especially at night uh, on Katahdin and had never summited. They believed that they would be killed by this creature until 1804 when they accompanied uh, a, an American who was dead set on going up uh, Charles Turner Jr. Uh, in which case they, they, they came back down and nobody would believe them that they'd gone up because of course this creature was gonna carry you away. Now this description is really largely about uh, the, this, this guide's stories, right? The, the native story was actually quite different. Here's a modern book that actually retells some of the, the Pomola legends uh, called Night Wings and it's written by Joseph Bruchak who's actually an Abenaki author. Uh, it's a wonderful story. It's a fiction story, uh, but it's a retelling sort of a, a modern retelling of, of traditional themes. And here's what his artist describes it like. And there's only one traditional image that is old. And this is from the, uh, the, a, tr uh, a book published at the centennial anniversary of Orono, uh, the, the town of Orono here in Maine, where uh, uh, Old Town is, and, uh, or, or where the Penobscot Nation is currently. Uh, and or near that, sorry, 
babbling about. And the, this is from the treaty signed with the people of Orono, sort of with the Penobscot nation. And so this image is there and it's, they always describe it, native descriptions always talk about how it has long wings, a gigantic eye, a beak and long talons. And it's big enough to carry off a person uh, even a moose, right? And it can make ferocious winds and sounds and things like this. And so a lot of people look at this image and they're like, what am I looking at, right? Because it doesn't look anything like this. Of course, that was all made up by this guy. Uh, and, uh, and so this image here, I think this is an eye, right? And this is a beak and these are wings, even though they're not very large and they're usually described as scraping on the ground. And then these are great big talons and this is a person that's being carried away. And it was said that he would carry away, Pomola would carry away anyone who dared to venture into his territory, especially if they're disrespectful, would carry them away and actually uh, you know, take them to the, the land of the night air, uh, and uh, which is where he lived for part of the year as well. There were also good stories where he would fly across the land and people could summon him with fires and by calling his name and he would land and he could actually grant wishes and carry prayers and things like that as well. So it's a mixed bag with Pomola uh, historically uh, with the Wabanaki people. And of course, he's continued to evolve. And if you were to look at modern beer labels from Baxter Brewing or at Boy Scout patches, you would see something like this, uh, the, the day drawing here described by uh, Leroy Dudley, the guide uh, Chimney Pond for decades before it was even uh, Baxter State Park. So it's interesting how these things evolve. And of course, people can go up and down Katahdin today. So, you know, maybe that reflects our changing relationship or just the way that we think about nature. Kind of interesting. We also sometimes hear about Lunxus. This is a creature that gets all sorts of attributions uh, from Bigfoot to like mixed up with Pomola and to like a demon in the woods. And it's described often colloquially as the Indian devil. And so when early lumberjacks and hunters would talk to the Wabanaki about, you know, what kind of animals were out there, there was bears and there's, there's uh, beavers and deer and there's lunxus. And of course they're saying these in Native and they're like, what's the lunxus? And they're like, well, he's, he's a real devil, right? And that's what they would describe him like. And so that eventually became, oh, he's like the devil that was supposedly the only creature that Wabanaki hunters were actually scared of. He would come into camps, he would steal the food, fearless, he wasn't scared of fire, he would bite gun stalks in half, and he would then foul all over the inside of a lodge after, after trashing the place. And so, of course, there got to be all sorts of stories about this. Now, this was in the 1800s, lumberjacks, you know, you know, Wabanaki people were lumberjacks telling these stories to them. They were trappers and hunters. They interacted with each other. And of course, there was probably some speculation about what kind of animal this was. And a lot of people think, especially even like Thoreau, think, oh, well, what might they have been scared of? It must have been a mountain lion. So you'll see many, many historic and modern sources say Lunxus must be a mountain lion. Uh, now, where you'll find Lunxus today is in the new Katahdin Woods and Water uh, National Monument. Uh, and I ran across that park because it's 40 miles just for fun this summer. Uh, and, uh, and I ran over Lunxus Mountain, which is this scraggly mountain. There's also Lunxus Camp and Lunxus Pond out there. And it's really a foreboding kind of little small craggy mountain. And it was really foggy when we were up there. And I was pretty excited because we were almost we were about a third of the way done, or two thirds of the way done at that point. And so we didn't see any Lunxus, but it turns out what a Lunxus really is, if you actually understand the Penobscot and Wabanaki languages, is it's actually this guy. Kind of looks like a fisher, kind of looks like a weasel or a badger, but it's actually a wolverine. And part of the difficulties of understanding what a wolverine was, was they were very rare always by the time of European settlement and went extinct even before uh, the mountain lion here in Maine. Um, and so there wasn't a good word for it. They didn't were talking to Europeans about it. It wasn't expected to be here. So who would know it was that? But of course, there are lots of early stories about wolverines being here. And there's all sorts of mythological stories conjugated into the distant past about lunks or locks, uh, which is uh, a conjugation that 
you know, which is sort of this evil trickster uh, character in the, the, the myths of the Wabanaki. And then the ending, Seuss or Sis and things like that actually mean that it's small, it's imminent, it's present, right? It's to sort of distinguishes it from that. Uh, from that mythological creature to something that's imminent, something that's here. Um, and, uh, and this ending sort of means small, kind of like the French, like et, like kitchenette um, is a small kitchen. Um, and so the Wabanaki people are part of the greater Algonquin cultural language group, and they have all sorts of creatures. We know stories about uh, Blue Scab, uh, the giant, there's the thunderers and all sorts of fearsome giants on the end there uh, towards, um, towards the right side of the screen, I guess. Uh, and uh, over here that you would want to avoid, and we'll talk more about them. But one that I'm really fascinated by is this. This is a petroglyph uh, that's uh, in Emden, Maine. It's in the Kennebec River. Uh, and here's the head of the creature. Here's ears. Here's an open mouth. And here's an undulating body that ends, interestingly, in a pointed tail. Here's some legs. It's standing on either a wave or a rock or something, and this carved into a rock with hundreds of different petroglyphs in it. Uh, and here's the two front legs, and this is some damage, and this is some horrible graffiti that somebody has carved in there 2016. Good for them. Um, and that's terrible, by the way. And so this was an important place to the Abenaki people, the Kennebecs, uh, who, who lived there uh, over the course of what archaeologists think was hundreds of years. They visited and many individuals carved on this. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of cool. So there's lots of stories about big snakes uh, like Kitsiatosis, uh, atosis meaning snake, uh, small snake. There's that ending again, cis, the standard, like historic spellings are not at all standardized. There's, they have standardized spellings of uh, Wabanaki languages today, uh, but these don't always follow them. This is a, a historic bark etching by uh, a, a chief of the Passamaquoddy. And so there's all sorts of stories about these serpents that could actually communicate with people. They could change shape. They could marry people, but they could also eat them or trick them into like feeding poison to their, their spouses and devouring them and all sorts of interesting stories about these creatures. Um, and uh, here's a beautiful picture by Dan talking about this. And these stories about lake and river monsters extended well into the 1800s, even uh, outside of the Wabanaki nations and places like the Machias Chain Lakes and Moosehead Lake actually have a number of sightings of uh, lake monsters, and they're described with this interesting undulating shape as well, and all sorts of other interesting characteristics. Um, so there's also mermaids, and of course, Europeans brought mermaid stories with them and saw mermaids. There's all sorts of very early stories about mermaids here. Here's a picture of a historic German map from the uh, you know, early colonial days where in the North Atlantic they've drawn, and of course they draw all sorts of things on this, uh, a mermaid, but there are stories from right here in Maine as well. And of course the Wabanaki also had water people uh, that are similar to what Europeans would describe as uh, mermaids, such as this guy, uh, which is a small mermaid, uh, the Lumpaguin. Uh, and uh, they are little water people who can transform. They sometimes are described as having a, a fish or serpent tail. Um, but they can also transform into having legs and they'll play in the shores. And they can often be found fighting with another larger type of more malevolent uh, mermaid, this guy called the Nodum Canwet or the, uh, the Apodumpkin. Uh, and there's stories about, there's an interesting story about battles between these two races of mermaids uh, at reversing falls in Maine. And there's all sorts of reversing falls to either side of the coast here of Rockland, where we're at on the other side of the Penobscot, down in the Dermare Scotta and the Sheepscot River all have reversing falls where the, the would be you know, mixing between the water and these reverses and very dangerous places to paddle. So, uh, you know, you got to watch out for this. And of course, these guys are really troublesome. There's all sorts of stories about creatures like this that uh, one is said to live under Indian Island and would come out and anybody it saw on the shore was in for trouble, it would grab you. Uh, from underneath the water and drag you down. And it was said to be the creature that would fill your eyes and your ears and your nose and your mouth and all of your orifices with mud if you were to be dragged down into the river and you would die. And they are also responsible for a cholera outbreak in Bangor, supposedly, um, which is, you know, 
very scary, these very powerful creatures. Luckily, a lot of the stories talk about how there's not very many of them, but they're powerful and able to transform. And the stories are quite varied about these guys, which is to be expected. There's also a host of little people that populate Maine. This guy's the Mickham West. Again, this is drawn by uh, the Passamaquoddy chief, Toma Joseph. Uh, in 1884, there's a wonderful book uh, about him, a children's book that just came out. But he carved all sorts of interesting uh, bark etchings about the traditional stories. And this is described often as the Indian puck, the Indian good fellow. So these are the forest elves, extremely powerful, had relationships uh, in friendship ways and helpful ways with the, with the native people. And they were always protecting things around them. So kind of uh, linked to very similar to the kinds of uh, little people stories that you would find in European folklore as well. And here's a wonderful picture of these fabulous clothes wearing and they could dress and appear in all sorts of different ways that Dan has drawn. And another one that I really like is this guy, uh, which is the uh, Managamasak, uh, which is the uh, is a plural ending for them. And these guys are little people that live on rivers and they paddle around in stone canoes uh, and they can paddle in any type of water, no matter how big or how small or how swift. And they can also go underwater for as long as possible. And they're described as having a hatchet shape. It's very, very narrow. Notice how very large their nose is. And they were very helpful to people. And you could wait around. They really don't like lots of noise. But if you wanted to talk to them or ask them a favor, and a lot of these little people, just like in European folklore, if you were to save them or capture them, they would be obliged to do you favors or even marry you or you know, take you things or do favors. But also if you talk to them nicely or if they know that you respect the area where they live and, and respect them, they would, they would help you. And so there's all sorts of legends about these guys warning of invasions of neighboring nations like the Mohawk. Uh, and they would, you know, if you disrespect them, like if you were to laugh at them because they have a giant nose and a very skinny face, uh, you know, and they're very sort of self-conscious about how they look. Uh, and if you were to insult them, they could cause all sorts of trouble, tip your canoe over, uh, they could tear your nets, tangle your lines, all sorts of things could go wrong. And they spend all of their time sort of carving and shaping clay and stone. And so you can find evidence of these guys in these little fairy stones. So I don't have a picture of there anymore. These little fairy stones called what geologists would call clay concretions, they can be all sorts of shapes like wheels, buttons, or, or balls, and they're found all up and down the Penobscot River, uh, and, uh, and they would spend all their time shaping this uh, at night, and then you could find them during the day, and they would bring good luck. And we have similar stories uh, in Europe about these same things, and all across North America, these sort of fairy stones are described as such, and uh, they're, they're really cool. Um, and there's some pictures of them in the book. Um, and so this is one of the scariest creatures, I think. This is the Chenu uh, or the Kiwak, uh, which I've probably mispronounced there, uh, which is also more well-known popularly as the Wendigo. So here's another one of those pictures of the historic image here, uh, which you can see this guy is a cannibal giant. You would sort of uh, hunt people and they would hunt each other and they could change shape from being normal size to being gigantic. They don't have antlers like the Wendigo in popular media or movies or horror movie that we see about today. And these were widespread throughout the entire area where you had the Algonquin language group and cultural group people which spread all across sort of like the, the upper east of North America. Um, and, uh, and this guy, what he's hunting here is this giant, he has been adopted or welcomed into the, the home, the lodge of these two people who are out at a hunting camp. And to keep him from eating uh, the, the people who live there, they've decided to treat him like their grandfather. Uh, and so he at first is a little skeptical, but then you know they're being really nice to him. And so he decides he's gonna be nice to them back. So that's kind of a cool story where otherwise they, he just goes around and eats people. And so you know he's really hungry because he can't eat normal food. And so instead of eating the people who live there, he decides to actually go to a spring and actually summon up this creature from the underworld, uh, which is like a lizard. And the underworld isn't like hell or anything like that in Wabanaki worldviews. It's just got like some of these serpents are said to live there and also these great big lizards. And so he killed and ate that and throws the bones back in so it'll regrow. And so kind of these really cool stories about, and it ends up defending them from another 
uh, Wendigo or Chenu that was actually coming in there and howl is said to like shake the land and knock down trees and actually can kill you if you hear it. So, you know, he uh, ended up, uh, you know, protecting them by telling them to shove mud in their ear, your fat in their ears so they wouldn't die from his battle there. And he ended up you know, didn't, didn't end too well for them, but he saved this, this family there. And so I think that's kind of a, one of my favorite creatures there that has some lessons to us. And he's usually described as a big guy with like matted sticks and mud and fur all over his body. And it's said to be a curse. It's not a race of creatures, but people have done terrible things like cannibalism, where they've even cast the Wendigo curse on themselves, and will actually become possessed by this spirit, this non-biological entity that changes them into this cannibal giant with this terrible power and no matter how much they eat they're always hungry and the more they eat the hungrier they get so in some ways it's a curse it's an embodiment of greed and so to have these stories about redemption about that i think is a powerful lesson uh, about the people who tell them that but it was a creature you would definitely want to avoid but to have the bravery to to go towards that and say you know, like, oh, you're, you're my grandfather. And then, you know, to live with this creature that might eat you and see that it could change. That's kind of interesting. And so the French and the French Acadians, of course, were some of the first settlers to arrive. The Acadians arrived in the pink area uh, as the, some of the very first settlers in North America, uh, at least in this part of North America. Uh, and they brought with them creatures in particular, two of my, my favorite are the Lou Guru and the Lutin. Uh, and, and let's talk a little bit about what they are. And then of course the Quebec, the Quebecois people came and then they moved south into Maine and they worked together and lived together with the Wabanaki people and with the English people who were living here. And with them, they brought creatures of, you know, creatures of the old world with them, like this guy, which is a werewolf, a famous werewolf uh, illustration from the old world where this creature killed over a hundred people. And these were people, the Luguru is a werewolf who's again, similar in some ways to the Wendigo that if you commit terrible crimes or you have make a deal with the devil, or if you don't go to church often enough and take communion, you could be punished by being turned into a creature that would transform into a man eating beast, but it could also be just into an animal as well. And that would be a punishment. You'd be forced to run around like that. Uh, and these creatures were very, very scary. They were uh, always talked about and always looked for at night, they would come around. Uh, and if you were to, you didn't need a silver bullet to protect yourself in those days. That's sort of from movie lore, um, though there is some older lore about that, but that wasn't a thing they talked about. But if you were to, were to cause them to uh, bleed, to bloodlet, if you were to injure them while they were attacking you, they would actually be forced to run away and then they would turn back into that. They would actually be freed from the curse. So that would do them a favor. So it's almost like the fact that they have to attack people is actually their only salvation. And they only you know, got punished with that way. So there's kind of an interesting thing. And there's no contradiction to people who are talking about hunting and living in the world and like knowing people and like being outside all the time to knowing that these types of things can be around and that you need to look out for them and that you could, how to recognize them and how to defeat them. And it's and they were very scary to, to people who knew about them. They were uh, creatures that fed on not only the bodies of people, but also their souls. They would dig up bodies in the graveyards just to eat their, you know, I guess their souls. Another creature that was really important is this little guy called the Lutin. Uh, and the Lutin is, would be translated to something like leprechaun. Uh, into English, and they're little house elves, you know, like Dobby, the house elf, uh, and they would attach themselves, unlike Dobby, who was like, you know, this is from Harry Potter, which is obviously not real, but, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, they would attach themselves to a house, a homestead, a farm, or a logging camp, and they could be a real blessing, they would help clean up, but if then they felt that you disrespected them, and it was very easy to disrespect them, they would start to cause problems for you. They would ride your horse into the ground at night and come back all sweaty, they'd tangle its, uh, you know, they put, you know, braids slash knots into the manes and tails of the horses. Uh, they'd sew your pant legs to sleep while you were uh, or sew your pant legs together at the knees while you're sleeping. So you go to put them on and uh, can't get your leg through there. They'd turn the meat in your stew into, into stones and all sorts of terrible things. Let the animals out when you didn't want it. 
And so if you wanted to get rid of these guys, you had to, you know, you, well, first of all, you didn't want to get on their bad side because they're really helpful if they were, if they were good, these house elves. Um, but, and they, they presumably still are if you're in relationship with them, uh, but they will, uh, they will uh, go away if you, there's all sorts of things that are said to make them go away, such as uh, blessings of the house or holy water, or even things like taking grains of rice or beans and spilling them all over the floor every night and then leaving a bowl out. And then they would feel obliged to pick up every single grain one by one. And if you do that every night, they will eventually get frustrated and just leave, right? Uh, you can also track them because they can change shape and size and get in through any door by spreading flour all over your floor and see if there's little footprints in there. So if you specs, so you got one of these, uh, there's, uh, there's things you can do about them, but stay on their good side. Um, and they're similar to uh, some of the Wabanaki creatures that live in New Brunswick, such as these guys, uh, which are uh, a Wabanaki creature that is, uh, you know, has some parallels with that creature. So it's kind of interesting. Maybe they intermarried with the Luton. I don't know. Um, but maybe. So one of my favorite sets of creatures is the lumberjack creatures. The fearsome critters of the lumber woods is what folklorists call them. And these are stories that lumberjacks talked about. These are stories that guides and sportsmen still talk about. So the Bildad, the Side Hill Gouger, the Tree Squeak, Agripelter, Dunhaven Hooter, Shagamaw, Wedge Ledge Chomper, Chomper, and the Pelton Thumper or Dingmaw are all some of the most famous ones. And anywhere you have continuous woodlands, uh, maybe this map should be extended a little bit. Um, you will hear stories about these creatures that they get rarer and rarer, the more, you know, the more settled a place becomes and people say things like, oh, I think they're extinct around here. Uh, or, you know, they've gone south or they've moved north. And these are the stories that kind of are somewhat of tall tales, right? But People often say, well, there's no proof that Paul Bunyan is, was ever alive, even though his birth certificate is right in the town office of Bangor in the, uh, the county, you know, the county records right there on the wall. You can go look at it. Um, not just his statue, but, you know, there are people in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and Michigan where he spent most of his career who would swear that they actually the last camp they worked at was with Paul Bunyan and they would never admit otherwise. And yet everybody, the folklorists who were collecting stories from these people would be like, well, they don't really believe it, you know, but you know, did they, did they really not? Is that not really true? Like, I don't know. Obviously there's some exaggeration to some of this. Interestingly, one of my favorite lumberjack creatures is this guy, this is Sock Saunders. Uh, and he is a little person, an Anglo-Saxon elf, he's described in the folklore often. And uh, his name was Sock Saunders, no matter where he lived. And he would cause all sorts of mischief to the lumber camps. And you can kind of understand why, uh, like, little people might be upset at lumberjacks. They were pretty rude and crass, hard drinking. They were destroying everything, pretty disrespectful in general. And so they would tangle up chains even while they were in use. They would break axes. They would cause all sorts of trouble. And this guy, Sock Saunders, there was like an incantation to keep him away. If you narrowly escaped a uh, you know, some bad event, you would say, get behind me, Sock Saunders, you didn't get me that time. And it would sort of keep them away. And so you can remember that if you're ever out in the woods having some trouble. Another creature that was a really early creature that Lumberjacks talked about was the landlocked walrus, kind of like the landlocked salmon that we have here in Maine, uh, uniquely. And so Manly uh, Hardy, one of the oldest naturalists and fur buyers who lived in Brewer, Maine, uh, traveled across Maine several times, and he always wrote about how whenever lumberjacks and trappers and hunters would be coming out of the woods, they would tell him to watch out for the freshwater uh, walrus, which are very dangerous, uh, more dangerous than their saltwater cousins. And, you know, they can suck the flesh right off your bones. They can tip over a boat, all sorts of things. Uh, and of course, you know, he never did see one, uh, but you got to kind of watch out for him. Now, another thing lumberjacks were scared of was this guy the big cat, as we already mentioned. And so that actually, as those became rarer and rarer, the stories about big cats became more and more rich. So this guy on the bottom, this is the Silofe, or sometimes called the Lucifi, uh, which is a really bad Englishization of the Lucivier, which means deer wolf, which is a French, ordinary French word for uh, the uh, 
what's it called? The Canadian Lynx. So, and they're known for their, if you've ever seen on like YouTube or heard one of these guys or even a bobcat, they make horrendous noises. And so the Silofe was said to be able to be a ventriloquist cat and it would feed on fear and it would make its jowl come from all around you and run you right in circles until you just collapsed from fear. And some say that they even fed more on your fear than on anything else. And the safest way to get away from them was just to walk straight. My great grandmother used to tell stories about what she called the Lucifer, which is an even worse mispronunciation of uh, Lucifi or Lucifer. Uh, and, uh, and talk about how she was scared of them calling at night when she'd come back from hunting, like, like actually, right? And so these are stories that people like colored how they lived, what they thought about. And of course, this guy up in the top, he's called the, uh, or the guy on the, the right side of the screen uh, is the bald-tailed cat. Uh, and this is another nocturnal sort of vocally skilled creature. And what they would do is they can mimic any sound voice or even song and they will lure people out of their camp or their tent uh, and by singing softly or calling you like with a friend's voice that they've heard during the day and they don't pounce on you or attack you they've got this hard bony tail and they'll smack you right between the head and knock your brains out nobody's ever survived an encounter with one of those guys so if you ever hear anybody calling you to come out of a camp uh you know just uh don't at night, right? It's trouble. Turn the lights on first for sure. Uh, and then this guy, one of my favorite, a little bit more harmless on the left there, though, if you wouldn't want to make him mad or apparently happy, because they also have a ball on the tail there. That's the ding mall, or what my grandfather called was the Pelton thumper. And they could break up trees into like little bits of twigs. And sometimes you'll see broken trees with their big long tail. It's a big cat. Uh, and they'll line their nests with it. They'll also beat on their mates so that they're sure to get a strong one. But you'd often see them sitting on a big rock ledge. Uh, and there's a rock right on the side uh, of the, the Appalachian Trail and the presidential range called, of presidential range called Dingmall Rock, where these guys will just kind of sit there and view. And you don't want to go up and bother them because, you know, they might get mad and swing that tail at you. And you're no tree, so that'd be trouble for you. Or if you, the well-informed guides would certainly let you know as well that if you made them happy, they might run around with their tail and, uh, and start swinging it around to show that. And that could end badly for you as well. I'm not sure how you make a, a ding mall happy, but don't do it. Uh, their name is suspiciously similar to uh, a tool called the dingle mall, uh, which was a lumberjack tool where they would drive cant dogs into uh, logs to actually hold them in places like a great big mallet uh, to allow the sawmill to actually chop it up a little bit. So I don't know which came first there, but uh, that's, that's the thing. And then there's like, aside from really scary and fearsome creatures, uh, there was also these guys, the unfortunate. Uh, this is one of my favorites, the bird there. He, they have uneven uh, wings, one's longer than the others. And that's no big deal in the old pine growth forests of Maine because they can just sort of fly around. And because their wings are uneven, they sort of fly in a, in a circle. And if they're in an old forest undisturbed, no big deal. They just land and sort of reset. But if you startle them, like you're cutting down trees or you're out there making a racket, they'll actually get scared and they'll fly off real quick. And the quicker they fly, it makes them uh, go in a nice tight circle. And that kind of panics them because they're not getting away and they fly tighter and tighter, getting closer and closer until their head goes kaput right up their backside. Uh, and they turn right clear inside out, fall on the ground. You can't even tell what you were looking like. Uh, and so these guys are pretty much probably extinct in Maine, unfortunately, except in some of the the most wild places uh, of Maine. Uh, but my, my cousin who lives at Packard's camps even today as sort of the manager uh, tells me that story uh, with great frequency and it's great. Um, and, uh, and so this guy is one of my favorite, probably one of the most well-known fearsome critters even today. It's called the side hill gouger. They have uneven legs. So they also can only walk in circles on flat ground, but it perfectly adapts them to living in the hill country of Maine. And so they're called side hill gougers because they'll, walk, well, they'll carve out a trail as they walk around a mountain. And if you're ever hunting them, you can kind of spook them and then they try and turn to get away and they tip right over when their long legs get on the top. If they do need to, you know, and sometimes there's a, 
you know, an, a, you know, a strange one born that has the, the long legs on the other side. And so they can actually cooperate and sort of lean on each other like wounded soldiers to walk across flat ground. And they've, they've spread right across the rest of the country, even though they originated right here. And they also have other stories. And on some mountains that are a little bit more lonely, uh, they can be quite fearsome and actually aggressive and attack people. And they get names like... Uh, uh, the side hill whomper and the, the side hill dowager and and they they can be kind of creepy as well so you want to you want to steer clear of them and, and don't eat them because they're actually a little bit poisonous to eat you know who else is poisonous to eat is this guy this is a mixed up creature he's called the bill dad uh, and the bill dad was something that lumberjacks would look for uh, it's uh, kind of like our uh, you know our platypus here of the main woods he's got a hawk's bill and long kangaroo legs and a big long beaver tail uh, and he spends all his time sitting on these sort of grassy outcrops and whenever he sees a trout surface he'll jump out and smack it with his tail now these guys are found mostly in western maine only uh in sort of the most remote ponds though they have spread around to other places i hear uh since then boundary pond which is literally a place you can't get to from here was the place originally talked about as the only place they can be found. It's right on the Quebec border. There's only the only road is a gated road from Quebec. Uh, and, uh, and so these guys, lumberjacks, they're always hearing things, you know, they're, they're always looking for fresh meat uh, for the, the camp cook to cook up. And so one day they caught one of these guys figuring they'd be good eating, kind of like most of the creatures in the main woods. And they brought it back to the cook uh, back at the, the lumber camp. And he cooked it up in a savory slum gullion, which is sort of a messy stew. Uh, and Bill Murphy, one of the most famous lumberjacks in the Maine woods, was the first one to dig in. But it was also the last thing he ever did because he sort of seized up, got glazed over eyes and let out a holler and then ran out to the nearest pond by the camp and jumped clean out into the water almost 20 feet with his feet right out in the seated position as, he was, as if he was a bildad smacking the water with his tail, but he wasn't. And he hit the water, sank underneath, and was never seen from again. And so watch out for these bildads, but you can, if you ever hear a paddle or a, a loud noise hitting the water uh, late at night in a, in a lonely pond, it's sure to be a bill dad for sure. And this is one of my absolute favorite pictures uh, that Dan did of the bill dad. And I, I like this full color image there. You can really appreciate the beauty of that creature and how tasty it must have been. Uh, so there's also pretty dangerous creatures uh, such as the Dunghaven Hooter. This is sort of like the Northern alligator. They live in the pucker brush, the green growth. After you have a clear cut, all the plants start to grow up and you can't even see the ground. You're going to trip over stumps. You're going to get stuck by prickers. And you better watch out because these Dunghaven hooters might smell you coming. They tend to like the smell of liquor, uh, especially rum, uh, and, uh, but really any alcohol. So if you're out there wandering in the pucker brush, before you even know it, one of these guys is going to knock you down with its powerful tail. Now, at first, you might think that'd be okay because one of its most interesting adaptations is it's got no mouth at all. But it, what it makes up for with no mouth is that big tail and two huge nostrils. And as we all know, our nose and our mouth are connected to the same thing. So he can't eat you in a normal way. So he smushes you down, you and everything you've got into a vaporous goo. And he turns around and he sniffs you up through his great big nostrils, never to be seen again, right? And uh, just your boots are left there. And all sorts of lumberjacks never came back. Uh, from the forest at night wandering around. And here's a uh, sort of a longer snouted version here uh, that Dan drew that I think is also quite great. They hibernate this time of year, so you're good to go. Uh, walking through the, the pucker brush, deep in the mud, just like a, like a turtle. Now, this is one that you want to watch out for tonight on your way home, or if you got to go out afterwards, if you're at home on Zoom, uh, is uh, the hide behind. Now, the hide behind is pretty sneaky and you know, the good thing about them, they're pretty deadly. They've got big, long claws. They're always sneaking up behind people and they're coming to get you. But if you ever think that something's following you behind at night, it probably is. It's probably a hide behind out there. But the good news is, is they're real shy. So you turn to look 
and they feel obliged to hide behind the nearest tree and they're real fast so they get behind there but if there's no trees they can turn real quick and they can actually hide right behind you just always staying behind you and so they get closer and closer but just keep looking over your shoulder now unfortunately these guys unlike some of the other fearsome critters have not gotten rarer with encroaching civilization they've adapted quite well to uh, you know, suburbia and urban and town life. And one of the things it turns out they like the most is if you drive a Subaru or hatchback or minivan, they'll get right in back there. And so just keep your eye in that rear view mirror because these guys might pop up and you don't want to, you don't want to have a hide behind catch you. Now I might think those guys are ridiculous, you know, but they, they were things that people told each other and tell each other even today and they build community you know, and they teach valuable lessons, if nothing else. But maybe they're also these little people, the spirits of the forest and the land who are a little bit mad at the lumberjacks for wrecking the whole place, right? I don't know. But we're quick to say nobody could possibly believe in any of that stuff. It's not in my biology book. But then we've got this thing, this little, you know, the quill pig, the porcupine, you know, it's a cross between a bear and a, and a beaver and a pig, and it has spikes all over it. Some would say that those spikes can be shot up to three feet at somebody who gets too close. They're not even scared of people. They can climb a tree. They eat buildings and boots and ax handles and everything. And only some of that stuff that I just told you is true, but people believe it all. My dog got some porcupine quills in him the other day. And my friends were like, don't pull them out because they inflate a little bit. And so they're going to break right off. And the quill then, once it breaks off, can work its way to the heart, right? And, or into a joint. It gets deeper and deeper. But only one of those two things I just told you is true, right? And so people believe all of these things, even today, when we have all of our science and everything is supposedly known. So I say, don't be so quick. I've got a jackalope hanging on my wall. I've got high school students, some of the best students in the school, and they come in and every year they're like, look, I, I knew those were real. There's a jackalope right there, right? But of course that is a, you know, the one I have at least is a taxidermist creation. It's got foam underneath its fur. Um, and so, you know, but that does happen when jackalopes and antelopes get lonely out there in the West. Um, we don't have them around here. So, you know, today we've got all sorts of our own creatures and uh, I, unfortunately, we are almost out of time, so I don't have too much time to talk about these guys. But of course, we've got Bigfoot with sightings all over the state. There's certainly a lot of empty space. Uh, we've got the Turner Beast, these big black dogs, which are reminiscent of werewolves, the Lou Guru, which was sometimes just a big dog. Uh, difficult to find, difficult to prove. Sure, there was a, a chow dog that was killed on the side of the road that was just some sad pet that was neglected that was the Turner Beast, but it's also you know, something that might, maybe that's just something that we found, but that big creature, the big black dog, the big black wolf is still out there. There's all sorts of other cryptids. People still think about sea monsters. Little people have often been replaced with little people from UFOs. We see all sorts of moving lights through the woods. These are stories that we still tell. Over 50% of the United States believes quite firmly that ghosts are real, right? These are things that science can't measure. These are things that we all believe and live our lives as if they're true, at least sometimes when we're thinking about it. It's interesting how our reality changes based on what we're thinking about. And if you live your life as if it's true, if it's meaningful, then it's real, right? It's useful. It's something that we can tell to each other. It's stories that we can share, weaving important lessons about how we relate to the earth and important ways that we can build bonds with ourselves and with the land around us. So if you know a story, I encourage you to, to tell it to everybody you know. Never be afraid to tell your story because these things are really important. And you know, something's out there. Science doesn't know everything. Trust me, I'm a science teacher. <laughs> but I don't know what that means. Anyways, feel free to join me on social media or on my website. I post blog posts every so often with all the new creatures that I'm hunting as I travel down the rabbit holes of new books and articles uh, and, and people tell me things and get me started. All sorts of stuff on social media as well. So I hope you'll join me. Check out my book. And uh, I'd love to take a few questions here, even though I went a little long. Sorry, Ben. So anybody got a question or a story or anything they want to share?
Oh, Michelle, so yeah, I'll write it for you on a business card at the end. Yeah. So and that's a that's a great it's a great book. Uh, so definitely recommend that. Yeah, I've got all sorts of books for sale. I'll be happy to to sell and sign those uh, with whatever time we have. If you're here, uh, anybody on Zoom have questions? Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, and oh, I see a question. There's one there. That's a famous still image from what's called the Patterson Gimlin film uh, taken, oh man, when was it? The 60s or 70s. And these were two professional, sort of semi-professional cowboys slash Bigfoot hunters. And they went out looking for Bigfoot and they ended up filming sort of that classic image of Bigfoot walking across that is sort of that iconic image of this ape with you know supposedly breasts and you know you can see the muscles moving and of course it's kind of grainy and the speed is a little odd nobody's quite sure they were in a rush as you would be to to get this guy on film and you know today you know we have you know cameras that are pretty smart but they weren't back in the day and so this is just a real famous image and if you have the internet you can get right on youtube and look up patterson gimlin footage and you can watch it uh, in, in full and watch this guy walk right across the, the forest there. And of course, that's not in Maine, no. uh, that's, that's out west. The word Sasquatch actually comes uh, from a Pacific Northwest uh, nation's language. Uh, that's a mispronunciation, of course, as it got Englishized. And, uh, but there's, there's stories all the way over to the Great Lakes uh, with, with Native people talking about that. Uh, and, uh, and people uh, in the Wabanaki Nation still talk about uh, these big creatures. There's no traditional name that I've come across, um, but you know, some Wabanaki people who are still around telling their stories, knowing their traditional uh, language may, uh, may, may know that word if it exists. Yeah. Oh yeah. In yeah, there's a lot of that in uh, in sort of historical literature where things are, you know, even modern day, you know, pictures from game cams disappear and, you know, is there a conspiracy to keep these creatures out of the public mind and that idea that there's some other way of being that might interfere with the way that we view our, our regular reality. You know, maybe, uh, but like I said, science doesn't back up really any of those existence. As a scientist, I would be pretty surprised if, if a scientist wouldn't want to be like, look at this thing, this is amazing, right? Like, I mean, that's why you become a scientist to share stuff, not to like keep it from people, to like really discover what's out there. And there's this huge culture of, of sharing and, and communicating about what you found. So, uh, you know, I don't know of any bones. Uh, I have heard similar things about that. I've never really looked into the historical reports on that particular uh, source. These are obviously the Wabanaki people, their, their myths, legends, their religion, their worldview is full of the idea that there are these giants who can also turn into ordinary sized people who have incredible powers and did great things to help the land get rid of monsters and other evil giants and prepare it for, for them to live. And in Europe, where we also, of course, uh, had see all sorts of giant stories as well, those tend to be much more harmful. There aren't that many good giants in European or Asian folklore, uh, whereas in, uh, uh, you know, in Wabanaki lore, we see all sorts of of good giants around there, including Blue's Cab, which is really important. And, uh, and like the Thunderers there, they're of course protectors that are still around uh, and good friends with, you know, looking out for the Wabanaki people and uh, have the ability to transform into birds or wings or things like that, according to the stories and the things I've heard. So always wanna be, you know, respectful that these are other people's stories and living traditions, and I'm not Wabanaki in any way. And this is their land, and that's their stories to tell. But these are the spirits of the land, and so understanding the stories that are here, I think, are important for us all to know, so that we can respect properly. 
Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. One from Zoom. Um, are these thunderbirds related to the moose eagle creature? I think they mean the pomola. Yeah, a lot of times you'll see people on the internet or other places making claims that that's Maine's, or even in books, talking about how that's Maine's thunderbird. That is not Maine's thunderbird, even though you will see like lightning uh, come out of there. It really doesn't have very many parallels other than being a big winged creature. Thunderbirds, I mean, the idea that you could call Pomola for help is reminiscent of Thunderbird stories, but they have the stories, all these stories and knowledge about the Thunder Brothers are much better matches for the way the Thunderbird stories, in, in my opinion, as with an anthropologist's hat on, not a native Wabanaki person, matches up better with the myths that are pretty widespread throughout North American uh, native lore about the Thunderbird being this large, benevolent, but dangerous if you disrespect like everything, uh, creature that, that you could be in relationship with. Um, so, you know, there's elements in both, I guess. That's where I'm going. Anything else on Zoom? Yes, Caitlin also asks, has Christopher been to the Cryptoz Cryptozoology Museum? I have, yes. yes. In, down in Portland, uh, of course, they're opening up a bookstore uh, and I think eventually moving the museum up to Bangor, which is my, you know, my area. So I think that's great. I think that's an awesome thing. It collects the stories from, it's the International Cryptozoology Museum, and it's the biggest one in the world. Uh, it's awesome. And Lauren Coleman is one of the most important, who's the founder of that, is one of the most prolific authors and important cryptozoologists alive today. Uh, so certainly that is a real treasure that we have. And if you've never been down to the Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, you should absolutely go down and check it out um, because it, it has all sorts of really cool stuff that'll you know, really bring you into the understanding of this modern folklore and even old folklore, You know, because we're the folk, we still have stories. We still talk about the way the world is and the mysteries that are here. And when I say folklore, I don't mean fake. When I say myth, I don't mean fake. I mean, foundational ways of viewing the world, right? So a lot of times people use the word myth as in, oh, that's just a myth. That is absolutely not what I mean. I mean that these are, are things that shape the way we view the world, right? Myths are fundamental to actually having a culture at all. So that's the way I view it. It's not a disrespectful or dismissive thing. Same with folklore. And, and that is an awesome place to go and check out uh, that, that place. And if you haven't been there, get, get down there. So any other questions? All right. Anything else on Zoom? Nope. All right, thanks for those questions, Caitlin. Uh, and thank you guys all for coming out and braving the cold and the wind. Uh, from all sorts of parts. And uh, I'm really pleased that uh, Dan could come out. So, you know, if, if you join me in giving him a round of applause for providing so many beautiful pictures to bring that stuff to life, I really appreciate it. And I'll be happy to uh, sell some books and sign them, or if you brought a book to sign that book uh, and you can have a free bookmark even without buying a book. Don't feel obliged to buy a book. They have it at the library. Libraries are amazing resources. Knowledge and culture is free and it's for everybody, uh, but books have to be made, right? <laughs> so they cost money. So, all right. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chris. This has been wonderful. Thank you. And thanks, Em, for having us out.